Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Saravana Kanan from Google, and this is my teammate, Sam Wu, uh, at Google. Uh, we've been uh, working on a tool called Watson for close to a year now, and I uh, thought we'll talk about it here. So um, if you look at the status quo for performance evaluation today, right? anytime you make a kernel change, people run performance benchmarks and say, hey, 10% improvement or whatever. Um, so when you're doing that, the harder setup to do your performance measurement itself is kind of pretty easy. Whatever device you're developing on, you do the performance measurements there. And it's also fairly easy to kind of scale that to a lab if you want to start monitoring performance in a lab. If it's like a production device, you have enough volume to kind of purchase a bunch of those and set up a lab. And you have hundreds of benchmarks to profile performance with based on the use case. And so it's fairly repeatable performance uh, measurements uh, for good benchmarks. Main issue most of the time, at least in talking about CPU performance, is uh, thermal throttling. Um, otherwise, if you have two devices, uh, they're mostly the same uh, performance. And in terms of attribution, we have uh, tracing to attribute uh, performance um, impacts to like specific threads, or you can like, get like a finer grained view of what's going on. Um, so it's pretty uh, reliable. We've got, kind of gotten used to how to do performance testing. But if you do, uh, you know, so that's like the typical device for performance testing. So if you're trying to do uh, power testing, the status quo today is that the hardware is not, uh, hardware setup isn't easy. It's typically like a custom solution per board you're trying to do power measurement on. That's an example of a Pixel 6 trying to measure power. You know, you need all of the extra hardware. And the cost can also be uh, pretty high uh, because it's not the same amount of volume. The device cost can be high. Uh, it can be finicky to set up. You nudge it a little bit, suddenly your resistances are different and the power numbers could be different. It's happened to me quite a bit. Scaling is also hard because you don't have enough devices and volume to scale for a lab. Um, Measurement-wise, there's no good common benchmark, at least that I know of, and no good uh, way to like, easily use them remotely. You have to figure out a solution for that. Um, and it's not also very repeatable because even though you might be, say, comparing between two Pixel 6s, the binning might be different, the manufacturing differences might be there that affect the power, and thermal starts having a huge power impact way before even throttling kicks in. Um, so in that sense, it's not very repeatable, and when it comes to attribution, you know, at best you get at the power rail level, and at worst you get at a battery level, the power impact of it changes. So again, it's not easily attributable to what did you do that caused the power to increase. So we kind of wanted to improve that situation because when I was working on power improvements, it's been, I've had all of these issues I talked about before. So one of the ideas was like, okay, can we just look at the traces that the kernel spits out and use that to estimate the power? So that's what Watson is about. It's like Watson to your Sherlock, if you're the Sherlock. Um, and it's trace based, so it's a pretty lightweight, low overhead. And the intent of this tool is not necessary to give you the exact estimates that you would measure if you're using a hardware measurement tool, but to give more like a percentage change. So with then without the change, how much percentage is the power going to increase? And this is for CPU, uh, not yet looking at other devices. Um, so what you're seeing here is just like a visual representation. We take the CPU frequencies and CPU idle state uh, trace inputs, and then we spit out a time series of the power, estimated power usage. Per CPU, um, and as you might expect, you know we have power curves for different states of the CPU. Active power curve, you know this, is, and this is for say for the big CPUs and middle CPUs, and things can actually get more complicated. For a little CPU, we have more like a power volume of data, because in the Pixel Six, the little CPU's power is dependent on the frequency of the little, the middle, and the big CPUs. So we can account for all of that complexity too in this tool. Not only that, also the point at which the kernel spits out, say, idle exit or entry traces don't necessarily match with the hardware because the kernel does a little bit more work before it actually can turn off. Or when it's powering on, it's doing a bunch of work before it you know, spits out the idle exit traces. So we actually measure the actual time difference we see in hardware by sampling it really quickly at the hardware level. And we know what the extra offset is. So we account for that in this tool too. If the kernel says it's like, hey, one millisecond is how long you were out of uh, idle, we'll say, oh, it's actually 1.1 millisecond, because we know that to be the truth in actual hardware. Um, 
And that's kind of like the setup on what you've done so far. And Sam's been working on uh, running some analysis and results, so he's going to kind of share those details right now. And thanks, Sarvana. So these are Watson estimates for 10 second runs of Bouncy Ball. And Bouncy Ball, as the name implies, is just an animation of a ball bouncing around on the screen. So we've done this 100 times for four different build configurations, with each of these dots here being one run. And as you may predict, and this is all relative to baseline, with the RC lazy build configuration, Watson is estimating a slight decrease in power with the 1000 hertz scheduling tick. There's a slight increase in power. And the combination of two is somewhere in between. Now all of this is meaningless if Watson is just spitting out arbitrary numbers. But we put in a lot, lot of effort to make sure the model is as accurate as it can be. So in the top row here, we have our, our power numbers relative to baseline from our actual source of truth um, hardware power measurement tool. And then the bottom row here is the Watson estimate, so the percentage change relative to baseline. And as you can see, they're all within a 1% error. So this graph is further evidence of what I was describing. Uh, whereas the previous slide was an average over multiple runs, this is listing out each run with each build here being a different color. And we're comparing the dash lines, which is our source of truth power, and the Watson estimates in the solid. Since Watson is at AB, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, you have been able to measure the power on the CPU rail in this case. I mean, when you are comparing the the performance, that's right. Yeah, you you are measuring exactly what you are estimating. Um, yes. So okay. this is the sum of all the uh, CPU rails. Okay. And yes, we we plotting the same value. Okay. Hardware yeah. is sum of all CPU rails. Watson is sum of estimates of all CPU rails. And. Uh, the bouncy ball, for example, I assume it's not um, CPU-intensive uh, workload. Um, did you check how the temp can impact your power estimation? I mean, or do you take into account the CPU temp or the skin temp in your power model? I'll get to the point towards slide, later in the slide. Okay, good. Okay, so. Uh, this, these are individual runs comparing the dashed lines, which is our source of truth, and Watson estimates and the solid lines. And since Watson is a A-B comparison tool, we just want the slopes and the trend lines to match up, which they do pretty well here in this graph. Now, in order to use Watson, you need to collect Profeto traces. And Profeto is an open source tool that leverages the kernel's F trace in order to come up with the stats we need in order to get our power estimates. And then most test setups follow this timeline here with the initialization and teardown. So we created this notion of Watson markers to define the period of interest and exclude the initialization teardown. We highly recommend using the markers because the initialization teardown in some cases can actually use more power than the test itself. And even if it didn't, it introduces noise to your test. So you can use the markers with the commands at the bottom. And once you have the Profeto trace, you can either use the UI at this link here or through the command line with these commands to get the Watson estimates. If you're using the Profeto UI, you need to enable the Watson plugin. It's just a few clicks here, and the setting is sticky, so it'll persist a prone browser restart. If you're in the Profeto UI, you might see something like this. Uh, if you're at all familiar with Profeto, you'll know that they have these CPU frequency tracks that change over time per CPU. Analogous to that, we've added the power estimate tracks highlighted in orange. Okay, if you were to draw a window on the threads there, you might see something like this, which is a per thread power attribution table. So again, I'm gonna compare the RC lazy with the baseline. So the RC lazy 
table is at the bottom, the baseline table is at the top. And here we're running, this is still bouncy ball, but we're specifically, we're looking at the swapper thread, otherwise known as the idle thread. And Watson is showing there's an 18% decrease in idle power when you have the RCE lazy build configuration enabled. Furthermore, we can look at the RCU preamp thread. This time we're looking at the idle transition overhead cost here. And Watson is showing that there's a significant decrease in idle exit power for the RCU preamp thread. Okay, beyond build to build comparison, we could look at run to run comparisons for the same build. Sometimes a process comes up sporadically that messes with your measurements. In this case, the bad run has almost three times the energy usage. This is still the 10 second bouncy ball comparison. And since Watson gives a thread level power attribution, we can sort by the top threads, th by either power or energy. And in this case, if you see something like Nexus Launcher, something completely unrelated to bouncy ball come up, you can throw this out and label it as a bad run. So this is particularly useful if you're using some kind of testing automation. Now everything I was showing before in the screenshots can also be extracted via the command line and you might get some JSON format in these pictures, similar to these pictures. Um, on the left side we have a per thread breakdown and then on the right side we have a per rail breakdown of the Watson metrics. Uh, I'll pass it on to Sarvana to finish off. So if you're wondering how do we use this tool for uh, kernel development, uh, right now, we only support it on a Pixel 6, but if anybody here uses a specific device for your development and you want to add support for it, we're more than happy to help you add that support to the tool. Uh, you just need to get the right power curves and we can work together on that. We have the contact information at the end of the slide, so you can feel free to email us about that. Uh, for suggested workloads, we suggest if you're going to do some Android testing, we suggest using Bouncy Ball. It's a really good analog to an average Android app. Um, and you know, don't do things like run a performance benchmark, it's gonna max out your CPU frequency, it doesn't really give you any useful power analysis. Um, you know, those are kind of common guidelines. After this is just a bunch of slides telling you where to get this tool, how to set it up. Um, let's kind of skip through them quickly. And then John Stulls has written a really good quick start guide on how to set up and use Perfetto, it's like super simple to use. And um, yeah, how to collect the traces in Watson, how to collect traces on a busy box kind of system. Doesn't have to be Android. It works on any uh, operating system and any um, distribution. And this is like the sample uh, input for the config file for preferred, basically saying, hey, collect CPU frequency traces, collect CPU idle traces. And we'll go to discussions, but before we get there, to answer your question, um, Vasa. So it does not have any thermal impact, and I personally see that as a very good thing. Because when you're doing power analysis, we want you to focus on things that you can actually control. If you have a really leaky device or the room temperature is different, you don't want that noise to be affecting your analysis of your changes. So it's not affected by thermal, intentionally too. So uh, for yeah, for this, uh, having the ambient temp, yes, but um uh, I mean, if you, I, I have seen, for example, that when I'm using a um, speedometer on, Android, uh, on P Pixel 6, in fact, at the end of the first run, the skin temp of the device is higher than at the beginning. Right. And you have to wait for Right, but with this you don't have to wait, that's the point. No, but you have to wait As long as you're not thermal throttling, your performance isn't going to be affected, your power estimates won't change. But it's intentionally won't change. No, but uh, if you rerun one more time, you will have some thermal throttling happening. Right. And, and, and the power consumption, I mean, if you have a use case, if you, have, if you change the behavior so that you have more temp peak, I mean, this will impact the, the power model. I'm not saying uh, that's really yeah, good, yeah. a really good way. I mean, I'm fine. It's just that I think. Right. We're not trying to address that be, point. Uh, I mean, We're not trying to address the point of power changing once you hit thermal throttling. Okay. Because most of the times, I think we have other issues. For even non throttling cases, we have a lot of power impact. Like RCU lazy, that has like a 3%, no, not even 3, I think 5% impact or whatever, right? Yeah. That's like a really good way to check hey, did my RCU lazy changes have a real impact I'm looking for? 
Or if Daniel is working on CPU idle governor improvements, you can use that to say, I'm seeing power reduction. Is it really true? You can look at the swapper thread to see is the swapper thread's power number going down. Okay. So those kind of things. So the going to a discussion, right? First, do you guys find Watson useful? You know, what can we do to encourage you to integrate it into your development workflows? Those mm -hmm. kind of questions. So yes, it's useful. Just one more thing for Pixel. I think that now you are updating the energy model. Huh? Uh, for, for some, for no, oh, by the way, this doesn't look anything from DT at all. It's fully independent. You can run any kernel version, it'll work. No, I, I mean that uh, I, the energy model, for example, now is updated dynamically or some device to be aligned with the, the reality. So you, you have your, the energy model that you're using is out of what is used in the... Correct. Completely okay. independent. If okay. you can magically run Windows on a Pixel 6, it'll still give you the right numbers. Okay. There's a question here. Oh, can somebody read it? Or is it here? Okay, I'll get to the question remote after I get to that, Daniel. Daniel? Me? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I have a question how you. So there, there is. Um, when you, you, you read the traces and you try to find out intervals of uh, workloads uh, at different frequencies. There is a dependency between the performance domain and the CPU, what the CPU asks for. So is, is the trace is able to, for example, you have a, a, C, a CPU asking for a, um, performance state number two, and then you have another CPU asking for a performance state number six. And so actually the first CPU is belonging to the same performance domain. Does the traces take the way into account the traces work today? They spit out the same frequency value for all four CPUs. Okay, so you can see that. And when you are doing uh, CPU idle, and you go to a cluster idle state, uh, are you able to find out? Yeah, account for that. Too. Well, you do the intersection yeah. between. Uh, yeah. So my question is, uh, how, how long it takes to uh, run the tool? process oh. to process the traces to Super get? Super quick, like seconds. A hmm? couple of seconds. Spent. A couple of seconds. So it's so uh, like we run this on like say four-hour traces. We can use the UI, so it's like it's not slow enough where you can't use the UI. You draw a box, wait like a few seconds, it comes up, and that's like trying to do more processing than the command line stuff. Just asking about the command line stuff, it's pretty fast. Too. Okay. Yeah. So, so, sorry, sorry, could you could you, could you explain, explain how, to, how you convert if you idle states, states into into power? power. I, I, don't I don't see how that's generically possible. possible. Um, so can I repeat the question? Is the same person asking the question? As the... Uh, yeah, uh, that's me. How do you convert the CPU idle state? Let's say you know you've been one millisecond in state two. Um, how do you convert that into power? I, d I don't see how that's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying it's too good. Um, so we actually measured uh, the power usage of the CPUs on all of these different states, and we can extract the info. So for example, if we can say the little CPU is at one gigahertz in WFR C1, we know this is how much energy it's using. And but that's, C2, that's dependent. Hmm? For example, WFI, WFI is highly dependent on what frequency, frequency you're running at and, 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 and so, so forth. forth. So that's, yeah. that's why it's hardware dependent right so yeah right now like i said this this tool is generic enough to work on other hardware right now we have support only for pixel 6 i'm not saying this is going to work for your random device but if you give me the power curves we can easily insert it so that it'll start working for your device too so vasan likes to work on dragon board 845c for all the scheduler changes i'm saying let's work together to add support for that into watson so vasan or if peter z ever wants to <laughs> test it on an arm device we can give you a Pixel 6, please. I would love to see you do power regression testing for all your changes. Like, I will ship a device to you, please. <laughs> a, a related question that I had, and I see Morton has it also in the chat, which is like the C states don't necessarily correspond to reality because of what firmware does under the, under the hood. You, you know, Linux is going to ask or allow certain states, but the firmware might decide something else. So um, the traces aren't going to reflect that, where the you know, the actual measurements will reflect that, but the traces aren't going to reflect that, right? Um, that might be true. At least I haven't seen that, that cause enough of a variation in our uh, estimations. For everything, we've always tested with the real measurement, and like we're saying, it's always matching within 1%. Um, 
but just to kind of, because you brought up a point, for example, this will not work for x86, because even the Linux kernel doesn't know what the frequency it's running at, right? So this tool is not going to work for anything where the firmware just does its own thing for even frequency scaling. Uh, but again, if you can test it on even some devices for power testing before we land the changes, I think that'll be a huge step up compared to what we have not been doing so far. Okay, time out apparently. Thanks. Thank you. Great.